Fiji head coach Simon Rawalui did respond to that. By the way, he uh, said that it starts to get a little condescending to hear Australia talk about losing to Fiji and why they shouldn't have lost to Fiji and uh, asking, do our young men deserve that? I'm sure Mitchell meant no harm. He was just being impassioned about his own country, Murray. And to be fair, when it comes to national teams, we do tend to all get a little bit insular. And he did give credit to Fiji as well. It just feels as though the questions he's asking of Eddie Jones as to why he didn't offer more of a public explanation for leaving out the likes of Michael Hooper and Quade Cooper are actually pertinent ones. Like, uh, maybe Jones could have actually bought himself a little bit more patience uh, from the public if he had just laid out exactly what he was doing and why he was doing it. There are really valid questions that he asks. And I thought it was actually a really good rant. It was a rant. It was really well done. I, I'm surprised it got any backslash at all. I think he, he mentioned, give credit to Fiji. You've, you've, they've, you know, an Australian pod has to look at, at the Wallabies, of course. And there are questions that are hanging over Eddie Jones and that are, haven't been answered in any way that's satisfactory. They've just been, when they've been posed to Eddie Jones, they've been sniped back at about, you know, give yourselves an uppercut uh, and all this kind of stuff, which is absolutely entertaining, but certainly doesn't give any any background or any foundation to the decisions he's made, many of which are are baffling. And I have to say, I've I've kind of... Ha- Clung on to this hope that A. Jones is still has what he had as a as a head coach, but I'm probably one of the last to increasingly lose faith in in him turning things around and and proving that he still has what he had as a as a head coach. It just it kind of lurches now from one baffling decision to another, one outburst to the very next in a in a press conference. And while I do enjoy watching those those clips, if it was someone in charge of a head team that I felt deeply passionate about, I think I'd be more and more worried. And the performances just aren't there. Even the way he backed Carter Gordon and then, you know, gave him the shepherd's crook at the, you know, what, 10, 20 minutes into the, the sec, 10 minutes into the second half against Fiji, what that'll do to him is, is worrying. So it just looks like a shambles. And I think Drew Mitchell is absolutely spot on to, pose those questions as passionately as he does and it's good that there's people in Australian rugby who care clearly as much as he does about the jersey and what it represented to him and and the good times he had in it so I think it gives us a bit of insight into the damage that continues to be done in in Australian rugby union and I think the, the deep frustration here is that there's no plan at all is there like you bring Eddie Jones in for the Wallabies the year of the rugby world cup Rennie's let go um, you start the rugby championship with Quay Cooper at 10. You play Quay Cooper at 10 the whole way through the rugby championship. And then you get to the end and go, oh, no, wait, we're building a team for the future. So the five games that potentially had a plan to play Carter Gordon and give him five tests before the Rugby World Cup, that he gets to a stage where, okay, this guy's into a rhythm. That doesn't happen. It's Everything just seems so reactive. There's nothing from the top down. It's like Eddie Jones has been given full control. Do what you like. And change your mind as you go, which you just can't do the year of a Rugby World Cup, can you? When you think of the intricate planning that goes on for for World Cups, like with the Andy Farrell, how he's mapped out the the probably the last two to three years from an Irish perspective, there is just no cohesive plan to what the Wallabies are doing from a coaching perspective. Like when you look at Australia's structured attack off set piece, it's pitiful, it's underwhelming in its simplicity. It's Karevi or Valentini first phase and then make it up as you go. Like Jason Ross, brilliant, brilliant rugby league coach, has never coached rugby union attack in his life. And yes, he's trying to, he's the the mouthpiece for Eddie Jones, so to speak. But in terms of their structured attack, there is absolutely no clue in terms of what they're doing. And then structured defence, Brett Hodgson, rugby league coach, never coached rugby union. Look at how accommodating their first phase defence is and how easy Fiji got to the edge of some of those launch plays, whether it was line out or scrum. What don't you want to give Fiji is access to the edges where they then get momentum. And it's just, it's so sad to see that there's coaches that, quite frankly, are so far out of their depth coaching at international rugby. And you feel so sorry for the players that that they should be really well coached at this level, have really, really clear plans, particularly with an impressionable young playing group that don't have that bank of experience behind them, even more reliant on their coaching. And they're just so, so badly left down by the Rugby Australia as a system, not just Eddie Jones, but as a, a system in its entirety, how 
Australia, a tier one level team, have gotten to the World Cup in the shambolic state that they have. It's a really interesting point about some of the coaches that he's recruited. And obviously, a lot of the blame for Australia's uh, impotent attack actually lays at the feet of Eddie Jones because he's been running that side of things himself pretty much. What was he actually thinking with some of these coaching additions? Like, is it that he brought in guys who are inexperienced in union because they are going to be naturally uh, deferential towards him and allows him to run the show a little bit more? I don't even mean that uh, from an ego, egotistical <laughs> perspective, sorry, but just that maybe at short notice, he wanted complete control of the project, so to speak. Again, points to lack of planning. You're in a World Cup year. What top-level assistant coaches are on the market going to Ruby World Cup? Very little. And then the second side, which has to be, is, is the elephant in the room. Who wants to work with Eddie Jones? I think he's shown there's been such a high turnover of assistant coaches, whether it was with England Rugby Union. When you look at the churn of assistant coaches, he went to there. Uh, and then the inexperienced coaches that, that he brought in, like Gleeson from an attacking perspective as well, that had never coached rugby, um, rugby union as well. So he's got a history of doing this, of, of trying to be innovative and bring in coaches with fresh ideas. But for me, international rugby, you need to be an absolute domain expert in your field, especially with a very, very short window in terms of the five-game prep going into the World Cup. And we're just it, what we're seeing on the pitch is just a symptom of, of the coaching environment that they're in. Do you fancy Wales this weekend then? Or? If we're... <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to pick to be honest. When you look at, I just went back and watched um, their last game last November. When to be honest, everyone thought Dave Rennie would get the sack if if Australia lost to Wales and Millennium Stadium. What are they? Twenty one points down midway through the second half, and Wales snatched defeat from the jaws of of victory. Like it's a phenomenal comeback. And to be to be fair, uh, Mark Nwangatase has a really impactful second half and. He is a kind of shining light of Australian rugby at the moment, just his ability and loose play. But yeah, I don't know how Australia, to be honest, came back and won that game. They had such a, a frustrating November series that when you look at the Ireland game and France game in particular, they probably should have jagged wins there with a really um, high injury rate in terms of the, the squad that ended up playing that last game against Wales. So you just never know. I know I think Australia only won from four in their last four uh, games against Wales so you would say the the momentum is with Wales but um, she hasn't been impressed by, by Wales either and alarmingly Wales are the most or second most penalised team in the competition with 28 Australia with 24 so um, that gives you a sense of what profile the game might be in for the weekend What do you make of that game Roy? I'm back in Gats I think without the two Totemic powerhouse in the pack. Wallabies are greatly diminished. And I think I think Wales deserved a bit more credit for the Fiji win than probably has been the case or was the case. And they shore up a couple of bits in that and are a little more solid defensively. I think they'll have enough. 